So um, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you to Eric and Xavier and the other organizers for inviting me and for the Institute for hosting um, this series of talks. Um, I'm going to talk throughout the week on, on what I half-jokingly refer to as one-dimensional computational topology. So I'm going to be giving a, 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 a series of talks about topological problems in algorithms or algorithmic problems in topology involving um, curves and graphs usually embedded um, in surfaces, but occasionally I may veer up into higher dimensions, but only long enough to be scared and run away. Um, so I want to start by looking at um, a very early uh, uh, results in combinatorial topology, kind of as a warm up for the first 15 minutes, just to sort of set the stage for the more modern problem, which I'll talk about. Um, so combinatorial topology has its roots back, you know, many hundreds of years ago. Uh, the, the, the simplest topological invariants um, that topologists study for curves, uh, namely the, the winding number and the, the, the rotation number or the turning number, um, these uh, have been known and have been studied and have been applied um, for centuries. So if, if you, just to remind you in case you have forgotten, the winding number of a curve around a point is the number of times that someone standing at the point and pointing at the curve as, it, as something moves around, the number of times that observer needs to spin in place. The um, rotation number is the number of times that a person walking around the curve, always pointing in the tangent direction, rotates um, from their point of view. Um, in this particular case, the two numbers happen to be the same just because I chose that point. Uh, but if I, if I change the point, I get different winding numbers. The turning number doesn't depend on a particular point of observation. Now, these invariants trace their, you know, the, the earliest source of these I know of is um, in a treatise by Thomas of Bradwardine, who was uh, one of the Oxford calculators, one of the um, founding members of Merton College in Oxford back in the 1300s. Um, Bradwardine was um, perhaps better known as a theologian, but he also um, had several significant uh, contributions to mathematics, in particular an early version of the, uh, the intermediate value theorem. Um, that one of the things that works that he wrote was uh, Geometria Speculativa, theoretical geometry, which is kind of a follow-up to a commentary by someone else on Euclid. Um, and buried in, in Geometria Speculativa, um, uh, Bradwardine observed that if you look at the interior angles of a pentagram, a five-pointed star, they add up to two right angles, exactly like the interior angles of a triangle, at least if you believe in uh, Euclidean geometry. Um, and moreover, every time you add a vertex to the star, the sum of the internal angles increases by pi, exactly the same way as it does for um, uh, convex polygons. If you take a triangle, that's, two, that's pi. If you take a quadrilateral, that's two pi, and so on. Um, and moreover, if you increase the order of the stars, so if you look at this heptagon here in the middle, and instead of skipping over one vertex around the circle, you skip over two, this decreases the sum of the internal angles by a full circle. Um, he gives several examples uh, all the way up to uh, 10. Um, and uh, in modern language, what Bradwardine was observing, instead of thinking about the sums of the internal angles, if you look at the sums of the external angles, and you take a polygon that has p vertices and um, rotates around q times, um, people who are interested in knot theory recognize this as the basis for torus knots, um, the sum of the external angles sums up to exactly q circles. And this is the rotation number, the, the discrete version of how does the tangent vector turn. In this case, all of the rotation happens at the vertices. Um, so the rotation number of these star, regular star polygons is just the number of times it goes around, as you would expect. 
Fast forward more than halfway to the present, um, the first modern treatment of polygons in full generality was uh, done by uh, a German mathematician named Albrecht Meister, uh, worked at Gunningen, was mostly an applied mathematician, looked at things like um, building machines and a uh, bunch of optics and uh, wrote treatises on shapes of clouds. But um, he also wrote a work, a couple of works on geometry, one of which was entitled in Latin, um, you know, on uh, the generation of planar figures and properties that depend on them. Um, he defined a, a polygon as just a cyclic sequence of points where every adjacent pair is connected by a line segment. These points could coincide, these, the, the line segments could be collinear, there could be spikes and spurs, and you're completely general. This is a polygon over here that traverses the same segments twice. Um, and uh, um, he developed um, what's now uh, this sort of standard definition of, of the signed area of a polygon, or more generally the signed area of a self-intersecting planar curve. And the way he developed it is he said, well, this curve splits the, the plane into several regions. Some of these loops um, are positive. You can see the little hatch marks. Uh, some of them point in, some of them point out. Um, so you sum up the areas of the positive loops and you negate, you subtract the areas of the negative loops. And in particular, he points out that um, this little part that's labeled EQ delta E, that little lens-shaped region in the lower left, um, you would count it twice because it's included in the curve more than once. There's two green blobs that overlap, and so you have to count it twice. Um, and that multiplicity is exactly the winding number of the curve around any point in that region. Um, and he further developed this into an algorithm which is kind of the prototype for Green's theorem. Um, if I want to compute the signed area of a curve, I find all the places where the curve has a horizontal tangent, and this breaks the curve up into segments. I pick an arbitrary line, it doesn't matter, um, and I, for each segment, I take the area bounded by the curve segment and that line, counting it negatively if the curve is moving down and positively if the curve is moving up. Um, why is he interested? That is an interesting question. I'm afraid that my Latin isn't quite good enough to untangle that. Um, I think he's just playing around, honestly. Um, and so you, you sum up the, the, the areas of these regions and you get the signed area of the curve exactly as he defined it before. Um, and um, this also shows up as what's normally known as the shoelace algorithm uh, for computing the area of a signed polygon. Gauss later wrote about this, and for that reason, it's often misattributed to him. Um, but it was known uh, a good 80 years before Gauss did. Um, that you, you wander around the, 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 the edges of the polygon, connect them to an arbitrary fixed point, and some triangles are oriented one way, so you add the areas, and some triangles are oriented the other way, and you subtract them. Um, and this is exactly the algorithm that is used now, today, when we need to, to, to compute areas of polygons. Um, sort of buried in here is an implicit definition of what we now usually refer to as Alexander numbering, although um, Alexander only did it in the 1920s. Um, it was well known before then. <laughs> where um, you observe that the outer, um, every, the winding number of a curve around any point in any region is the same for all points in that region. Um, in the unbounded region, uh, the winding number around any point is, is zero. And for any two adjacent regions, the winding numbers differ by one, with the larger one on the left side of the curve, according to whatever fixed orientation you've given it. So this is the, exactly the multiplicity that, that, that Meister observes for computing area, um, but it was you know, later used by, by Mobius. And by the time Bruckner was writing about it in the 1900s, Bruckner was just writing a textbook that was completely standard. Um, and Meister went further and actually sort of viewed this, this um, rotation number 
uh, these, these invariants, really studied them as invariants and modifications of the curve. So what you see in this picture on the left is um, a self-intersecting pentagon where he says, oh, if you take that, that vertex in the upper left and you move it down, notice that the sum of the external angles doesn't change. Right? It starts out um, being 2 pi and it ends up being 2 pi. Um, and whereas over here, if you move that vertex in the upper left on the right side figure over to this point on kappa, the sum of the exterior angles does change. And the reason it changes is because as I'm moving, there's a point where two edges come together into a spike and then reverse. So some external angle changes, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it becomes 2 pi and then it wraps around, becomes, goes, or becomes pi and then it wraps around to negative pi. Um, and he said, well, this is fun. Uh, and he goes on to discuss about how um, positive loops and negative loops can kind of cancel each other out and you can move things around as long as you don't create spikes. And what he was doing was um, giving an informal polygonal version of what we now know as the whitney graustein theorem, um, described in full generality in a paper by Whitney, but um, he gave credit for the proof to Graustein, um, but of course neither Newton or Graustein were the ones to prove it first. Uh, so um, there's something called a regular homotopy. Uh, this is a, a family of a type of continuous deformation. For smooth curves, a regular homotopy means at all times every point has a well-defined non-zero tangent vector. For polygons, it means at all times um, edges don't form zero degree internal angles. Um, and two polygons or curves are regularly homotopic if and only if they have the same rotation number. Um, so this is all, you know, back to the 1800s. This is all structural results. If you want to talk about computational results, you have to go all the way to the 1830s. So um, I'm, I had originally the, had the title of this slide as the first computational topology problem but then I'm not sure, I can't decide whether the Bridges of Königsberg counts. Um, because, uh, so this is certainly the first computational topology problem where I'll explain the problem to you and I'm confident that if you went away for a couple of days and thought about it, you would not solve it. As opposed to the Bridges of Königsberg where basically, or I said, what is this nonsense, and then he sat down for a couple of days, oh, yeah, okay, figured it out, okay. So this, of course, is our, our, our good friend Gauss. Um, he did many, many things, um, not all of which he actually did. Uh, but one of the things that Gauss did um, in his, uh, mostly in the notes that he didn't publish, is he actually did a fair amount of work in topology. He, he never formally published it. Um, Gauss liked to reserve the things he published for things he really felt were done. Um, uh, and he never really felt that this topological work was done. Um, but one of the things that shows up in, in his notes is the algorithm that we now use um, in computer graphics and computational geometry to decide whether a point is inside a polygon or not. And this is really just a, a, a consequence of the shoelace algorithm. So if I have a, a, a simple um, polygon, a Jordan curve here. Um, this one looks like my daughter. Um, and I pick a point. I can decide whether it's in the interior or not by um, basically running the, the, the shoelace algorithm and figuring out um, some of the in intermediate results. But if you narrow it down to what's really going on, you shoot a ray in an arbitrary direction. Gauss go uses the positive x-axis. And you count for an arbitrary orientation of the polygon how many times the polygon crosses the ray going down and how many times the polygon crosses the ray going up. If those two numbers are equal, then the point that you started with is outside the polygon. And if the, those numbers differ, they differ by exactly one and the point is in the interior of the polygon. More generally, this is a way of computing the winding number okay, if you don't want to go through the Alexander numbering. Um, now, now, Gauss also went on to study more general properties of curves and to, to predict Saul's question. I don't know why. Um, uh, there's, I've, I've seen 
um, suggestions in the literature that maybe he was interested in um, enumerating knots. I've heard other suggestions in the literature that maybe he was interested in studying singularities of Gauss maps from surfaces. Um, so you get these folds on the Gauss map on the sphere. Um, I don't know, he didn't actually say. Um, but he, he studied the st structural things. In particular, he established a few conventions. Um, one is the, the, the notion of the sign of a crossing. So you imagine a point moving around the curve. Every time the point moves over a self-intersection point of the curve, you classify that, that occurrence, that, that crossing, as either positive or negative, depending on whether, in, from the point of view of the other branch, the one that you're crossing, you're moving from right to left, that's positive, or left to right. Or equivalently, if the point seems, the, the, the local winding numbers are going up, that's a positive crossing. If the local winding numbers go down, that's a negative crossing. Um, and then uh, he said, well, if you fix a base point and an orientation, I can label each of the vertices as positive or negative according to the sign of the first crossing through that point. Okay. And now Gauss gave this lovely little formula relating the rotation number, which seems at first like an inherently geometric thing, to the, the, these discrete things that I've computed here. So the Gauss showed that the rotation number of a curve is equal to the number of positive vertices of the curve minus the number of negative vertices of the curve, plus a tweak, which is the sum of the two winding numbers on either side of the base point. So in this case, gamma and gamma prime, those two winding numbers are zero and one because of the little, you know, that white triangle over there is the base point. Um, there are, I believe, six positive vertices and five negative vertices, and so, according to Gauss, this curve has rotation number two. Um, I, I, I think it's important to realize what Gauss did when he came up with this formula. Now, before this, we'd been thinking about curves as, well, it's a polygon, it's straight line segments joining a bunch of points, or it's algebraic, there's a, there's a polynomial and you trace it around. Um, but what Gauss is doing at this point is saying, you know, you, I, I, I don't care about coordinates. I don't care about angles, I don't care about smoothness, I don't care about straightness, I don't care about length, I don't care about anything, except this combinatorial structure. Essentially, I have here a graph drawn in the plane whose vertices each have degree four. And I have a particular way of walking around in the graph. The way that I walk around in the graph defines the winding numbers according to the Alexander numbering algorithm by Meister, Mobius, um, whoever. Um, and the crossings, the way that I assign the signs to the, to the vertices is, again, just a property of the way the graph is drawn in the plane. The, the only thing that actually matters here is combinatorial information. And so this gets to the heart of what computational topologists mean when they talk about doing computations with any kind of geometric structure is not the geometric structure typically that we, that we take in. We have to be given the data in a form that is discrete, that allows us to do symbolic manipulation. Um, the, the, the standard French term for what in English we call the data structure, I believe, is the structure de, de données, the structure of the givens. Right. You, you're given a curve in this, in this context by being given this graph whose vertices are the crossing points and whose edges are the curve segments with some additional information called a rotation system that describes how that graph is embedded in the plane. And it's sufficient for doing computation to record for every vertex not only which four edges are attached to it, but in what order as I go counterclockwise around the vertex. And so an algorithm that takes in a curve as input is really going to be given something like this, a four by n array, where n is the number of vertices. And we draw pictures that look like this because humans are not good at looking at arrays and understanding anything geometric about them. We draw the picture to give us intuition. This is really what's going on in, in, internally. Um, okay, so 
Um, and then once you establish the rotation system, um, you define the curve by saying, well, when you walk into a vertex, go two steps around the rotation, and that tells you the edge to walk out, out on. And so for algorithmic purposes, this is what I'm given as a curve. Okay. So um, in, I'm not going to walk through the proof of Gauss's formula, but I want to show off a few pieces before I get to the, to the real problem that I want to talk about. Um, so one of the things that, that Gauss did is he showed that you can decompose any um, self-intersecting curve into um, a set of weakly nested simple closed curves by, by uncrossing or smoothing or resolving the vertices. And in particular, given um, a, a, a crossing, you smooth the vertex, you replace the X with a, a pair of threads in, a, in the way that preserves the orientation of the curve in, in both of the pieces. This necessarily disconnects the curve. That's okay, we don't care. But when you do this, you get the, the, the curve that we've been showing before decomposes into these four simple closed curves in the plane. And these curves have the property that the, the winding number of the original curve around any point is just the sum of the winding numbers of these four curves around that point. And the rotation number of the original curve is just the sum of the rotation numbers of these four curves. Um, what you're starting to smell here is homology, right? It, it's not a homotopy, not a homotopic change, but I'm, I'm it's starting to get into, you know, thinking of these curves as, as, as one chains rather than continuous maps from the circle. Yeah. Well, right, because Seifert came in, what, the 1940s? And I ran out of room. I, so. I also didn't cite Alexander for Alexander numbering because I ran out of room. Five, five is the math. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's, it's it, yeah. Um, so um, Gauss in particular was, you know, thinking about this, and he, he, he used this interesting notation to write down the curves he was studying. He said, okay, well, give every one of the vertices a label. I'm gonna use letters, he actually used numbers. Um, and uh, write down the sequence of symbols that you encounter as you walk around the curve. Um, and also write down the signs of each of the crossings. So the first time I cross through vertex A, that's a positive crossing. The second time I walk through vertex A, that's a negative crossing. So I write it down like that. And then he's playing around with this and he realizes that um, there's an interesting question, which is um, I don't necessarily know that I can go the other way. I can't necessarily take this representation and turn it back into a code. And so Gauss asked, um, how do you do this? How do you decide, given a string with some signs on it, whether it corresponds to a planar code or uh, a planar curve or not? Now, go off and think about it for two days. Come back now that you're nice and confused. Um, and to give you some evidence that you're likely to be nice and confused, I'll, I'll refer to, to Gauss himself. This is an example of a Gauss code in the red box. The letters up there uh, correspond to that cycle decomposition that I showed you. Um, and translated into English, it says, oh yeah, there's some interesting patterns here. Um, you know, every symbol, every node needs to appear once with a positive crossing and once with a negative. Um, but that's not gonna be enough. Here's an example of a signed code that doesn't work out. Um, in order to make this work, you'd have to switch the signs on vertex two and vertex three. Um, again, this is the, these are the cipher circles. Um, and then there's an interesting footnote. Um, on December 30th, 1844, I discovered that the sequence of numbers in the middle row is enough to deduce the, both the corresponding crossing directions, the pluses and minuses on the bottom, and the connections of the tract, the, the way the cycles glue together. But that arrangement itself isn't arbitrary, but subject to certain conditions. The complete determination of which will be the subject of new works. And computer scientists are completely familiar with this phrase. Details will appear in the full version. Typical Gaussian modesty. I figured this out except for the details. Um, he never figured out the details. 
What he did figure out about um, 10 years later is some necessary conditions, and he used those necessary conditions to enumerate the codes with up to four, uh, four distinct symbols that uh, do or do not correspond to curves. The things with stars don't correspond to curves. I've now introduced Ben's talk on not, a new, on, on not tabulation. Um, uh, and so he asked, you know, what, what works and what doesn't? And, and he did observe, oh wait, a, a side note. Gauss is only interested in looking at unsigned codes, and so you might wonder, well, what about the signed code problem? Um, it turns out reconstructing a curve from a signed Gauss code is really easy because um, if you look at the signed code, see here I've highlighted the neighbor, the neighbors of vertex D. Um, uh, so I know that there's a straight curve that goes from C to D to E because I look at the first occurrence of D. And then G to D to J, because it's the second. And moreover, I know that they're oriented like this because the first crossing was negative and the second crossing was positive. And so this gives me the, the rotation, the cyclic order of edges around vertex D. So I've got a rotation system. And once you've got a rotation system, it's relatively easy to count the faces in the resulting graph embedding. And so you just compute the Euler characteristic. If the number of vertices plus ed minus edges plus faces is two, this is the signed Gauss code of a planar curve. If that Euler characteristic is anything else, this is the signed Gauss code of a curve on some other surface, but not in the plane. So really easy. Don't know if Gauss figured this out, but yeah. But it's not clear whether in Gauss code, it's not easy to derive whether it's on the plane or on another curve. I mean, it's clear that there exists indeed some kind of genus G surface which, which, uh, for which it can be embedded, but I mean. So a signed Gauss code corresponds to one isotopy class of curves on one surface, one orientable surface, the one determined by the, the rotation system. An unsigned Gauss code might correspond to several different curves embedded on several different surfaces, depending on what signing you infer. All right, so this signing gives you a unique... unique uh... The sign thing gives you a unique embedding on a unique surface. This, because you, the, the signs determine the rotation, the rotation determines the faces, the vertex edge and face count gives you the Euler characteristic. Everything is, is orientable because I'm doing clockwise here. Um, and or, there's only one orientable surface with any given genus. Okay, so unsigned codes. This is the, the, the more interesting problem. So Gauss, as I said, didn't figure it out, but he figured out a necessary condition, which is if you look at a, any substring of the code that has the same symbol at the beginning and the end, that substring has to have even length. So the code for this symbol can see the substring that begins and ends with A has length 10, that begins and ends with B has length 14, begins and ends with C has length 6, and so on. Um, the same condition was later, um, I think, independently rediscovered by Peter Tate and actually published by him. Um, Tate was actually explicitly trying to enumerate knots. That much we know. I can tell because it's written in English. Okay. Now, Gauss did not prove his parity condition, and for that matter, neither did Tate. The proof of the parity condition was um, established by a uh, Hungarian mathematician, Julian Nagy, in um, uh, 1927. And the way he argued was as follows. Um, walk along the curve and, and give each segment of the curve uh, alternating colors. So I'm going to start by coloring the segment that contains the base point blue, and the next segment red, and the next segment blue, and the next segment red, and so on. And what these alternating colors mean, it's really referring to a kind of mod two version of the Alexander numbering. Every red segment has an odd winding number to its right and an even winding number to its left. Every blue segment has an e odd winding number to its left and an even winding number to its right. This, of course, all works because we're in the plane and there's a Jordan curve theorem and it's right, good. But then once you do this and you realize that there are really only two possible patterns that can show up at a vertex, you're going to see in blue, out blue, out, in red, out red in either clockwise or counterclockwise order. In particular, that means if you walk out of a vertex along, say, a blue edge, 
When you next walk into that vertex, you have to, if say I walk out vertically, when I next walk into that vertex, I have to walk in horizontally. Otherwise, I'd be stuck in a loop and I wouldn't traverse every edge in the curve, but it, it's a curve, I have to traverse every edge. So whenever I walk out of a vertex along a blue edge, the next time I walk in, I have to do it along a blue edge. Whenever I walk out along a red edge, the next time I go in, I have to walk in along a red edge. And so between the exit and the entrance, there have to be an even number of color changes, and each of those color changes is exactly one symbol in the code. Okay? Now, if I take this picture and I throw it up against Gauss's decomposition, you might notice some similarities here. Um, I, uh, I think this may be what Gauss was thinking about when he came up with this parity condition. But again, I, can, I, I, I can't read either of the German well enough to, to, to decompose if they're actually doing this or if it's just a coincidence. Of course, mathematically, it's not a coincidence. Um, but both Gauss and Tate, after, after, after stating this parity condition, um, declare, uh, no, but this isn't sufficient. We can come up with counterexamples. Gauss came up with um, these two counterexamples um, uh, in, you can see that up there. Tate came up with a third counterexample. Um, and you'll also notice that, that Gauss actually had some internal, slightly different no, notation where, yeah, the, the two by n matrix, where he would list the index of the positive and negative crossing for each label. Um, this is a bit more similar to uh, the Dacre Thistlethwaite codes that not theorists like to use. Um, so they said, okay, we need this parity condition, but it's not enough. Um, but it was enough that let Gauss actually enumerate all of the 10 vertex, uh, the, sorry, the five vertex curves, um, and enough to let Tate, I think, enumerate all the six vertex knots. Uh, the solution um, to Gauss's problem uh, would have to wait for um, Max Dane. So Max Dane was a student of David Hilbert, um, uh, one of the godfathers of combinatorial topology, wrote uh, a fairly influential survey in, uh, I think it was 1907, with Paul Haygard that more or less laid down the, the foundations of the field from the combinatorial standpoint. Um, uh, you may know Dane because you like to cut polyhedra into pieces. You can invent Dane invariants. If you study polytopes, you may have heard of the dane somerville relations. Um, if you do combinatorial group theory, of course, you know Dane's algorithm. And if you don't, I'll tell you about it tomorrow. Um, but um, Dane actually proposed a complete solution to Gauss's problem. Um, and he started by, by doing exactly the opposite of what Gauss did. So Gauss resolved vertices in, of a curve in a way that preserves local orientation. Dane smoothed curves in the opposite direction. He said, well, I can smooth a, a vertex so that I keep the curve connected, but necessarily that means part of the curve is going to be reversed. Okay. And then if I... Uh, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do this for every vertex in my curve in an arbitrary order, but I'm going to try to do it at the level of codes. Um, and so uh, smoothing a vertex um, uh, in a curve in the code corresponds to taking that substring and reversing it. I'm sorry, I'm not going to update the picture until the end. Um, and so it can reverse, and then reverse, and then reverse again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And you get a new thing that looks like a Gauss code. Um, and what it is, is the, what's sometimes called the tangency code. You smooth all the vertices in arbitrary order, but, but at each vertex in a way that preserves the connectivity of the curve. And what you end up with is a curve that touches itself, but at the original vertices, but never crosses itself. What we would now call a, a, a weakly simple closed curve, because if you just perturb it a little bit, it becomes simple. Okay. And so this is the second condition that Dane said, um, I'm, I'm using somewhat more modern language here, um, uh, a necessary condition is if you do this untangling, you have to get this tangency code. Oh, given a Gauss code, 
it, does it correspond to a curve? So why can't I enumerate all two to the end? Because I'm a computer scientist and that sucks. Okay, you can go. <laughs> it's, a, it's a completely unsatisfying solution. I mean, if you're sitting in your basement enumerating vertices, you know, curves with 10 vertices, okay, maybe you have time to enumerate all 1,024 sign patterns. I don't have that kind of patience. Okay. Um, so, I, 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 that, that to me is not understanding. Right? That's giving up. Yeah. Okay. So um, you need to get this. You, once you untangle the code, you need to be able to get this this tangency code for this self-touching, so weakly simple closed curve. Um, but 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 Dane took this further and made it a little again a little more symbolic and a little less geometric. Um, you can define this sort of abstract graph, which is now usually referred to as a Gauss diagram. So you take the untangled the untangled code. And you write the symbols around a circle, and then you draw an arc connecting uh, both occurrences of the same symbol. Okay, and uh, well, this is just the graph. If you let me push the button, <laughs> and then um, so uh, the condition is this: this graph must be planar. It must be possible to draw this graph in a way that none of the edges cross. And this is equivalent to saying, I must be able to draw some of the arcs of the Gauss diagram on the inside and other arcs on the outside, and the inside arcs don't cross and the outside arcs don't cross. And the, the, the reason for this is if you take the arcs of this planar Gauss diagram and you contract them, pulling the main circle with you, what you get is this curve over here. Or equivalently, if you take this self-touching curve and you deform the, 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 the weakly simple curve until it's actually a circle, and you carry these um, neighborhoods with you, they will become neighborhoods of, of these arcs. Okay. This is what the coloring, some of these tangencies, are, the curve is touching itself on the inside, some of these tangencies are touching the curve on the outside. Okay, so this is a condition that, that, that can be tested because now I've, I've reduced it to combinatorial information. So um, Dane didn't do this, but the modern way of, oh, sorry, I one needed to, to say something about this because I, I, I really want to resurrect this particular nomenclature. Um, Dane referred to these drawings as a Baumzwiebelfigur, um, tree onion drawings. Um, because the, it, the, if you just look at the disc with the interior arcs, that is the dual of a tree. The, if you look at the adjacency graph of the faces, you get a tree. That's in fact how he derives them. And if you take the disc and you contract it down to a point, the outer things contract down to a bunch of loops that are nested like the layers of an onion. Um, we usually refer to these, as, these structures as tree co tree decompositions, but uh, I really want to bring back tree onions. Okay, so um, the modern way of saying this, which I think was first made explicit by Rosenstiel in the 1970s, is, um, well, I have these things, these arcs in the Gauss diagram, and I want to classify them as inside and outside so that there are no intersections. So I define a new graph whose vertices are the arcs, and whose edges correspond to pairs of arcs that would intersect if they were both on the inside. They're interlaced, the endpoints. If, for example, you look at um, arcs, uh, let's say, A and I, um, the endpoints alternate, A, I, A, I. And those two arcs are said to be interlaced, and so they define an edge um, in the interlacement graph. And so the condition that you, you need to be able to draw the arcs on opposite sides of the curve is that this graph must be bipartite. You must be able to classify some vertices as corresponding to interior arcs and other vertices as corresponding to exterior arcs. And so um, uh, at this point, we have a complete solution, actually. Um, if the code satisfies both Dane's parity, or Gauss's parity condition and Dane's untangling interlacement bipartiteness condition, then it is in fact 
the, um, the, the Gauss code of a planar curve. That's correct. Any order at all. Doesn't matter. Okay. So, um, okay, so I have a condition, but I remember, I'm a computer scientist. I'm not happy with just saying, ah, something exists. I want to be able to actually do it quickly. Um, and in fact, this for me, because I'm a computer scientist, is actually the easy way of understanding the proof. Yes? I'll talk about that at the end. The answer is yes if you're a mathematician and no. Yes if you're a mathematician because you can do as Saul suggested, you just try all the signings. And there are a couple of other solutions that boil down to try all the assignments of something to, you know, with an exponential number of choices, but in terms of efficient algorithms, no. Okay. Um, yeah, that's because it's hard. Well, not, sorry, not that's because it's formally like NP hard. That also is an open question that I'll talk about at the end, but because it's, it's hard. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so here, here, here's the actual algorithm. Um, and I'll walk, I'll walk through, don't, don't worry about the details, I'm going to walk through some examples. But you'll notice there are two places in the algorithm where you see the phrase or fail. What this algorithm does is it takes in as input an unsigned Gauss code and it produces as output a curve that is consistent with that Gauss code. But it's possible that the code that you're given doesn't actually correspond to a planar curve. And so there are two places in the algorithm where you can abort because I, I know it doesn't satisfy either Dane's condition in line, or line six or Gauss's condition in line three. Um, so I'll, I'll go through this with three examples in parallel. Only one will work out in the end. Okay, so um, I start by building um, a four regular graph from the code. So um, for every pair of adjacent, for every symbol in the code, I have a vertex. For every pair of adjacent symbols, I have an edge. So in particular, over here, A, B, A, B, I've got two symbols, so I've got two vertices, and then I have an edge between A and B, an edge between B and A, another edge between A and B, and another edge between B and A. Okay. Um, I'm going to mark the base point on here. This is the edge that corresponds to wrapping around from the last symbol of the, of the code back to the first. Um, this is just so in the end I will get a curve with the correct base point that will give me exactly the right code. All right, and this is easy to do in time proportional to the number of symbols just by doing it. Um, now I'm, gonna, I'm going to channel Naj. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit strange. I'm going to alternately color the, the edges um, as you walk around, but I'm also going to alternately orient the edges. So the first edge one that, that contains the base point where I wrap around, I'm going to orient forwards, and this one from B to A. The next edge, which should go from A to B, has the opposite color, so I'm going to give it the opposite direction. So I have an edge forward, then an edge backwards, then an edge forward, then an edge backwards, then an edge forward. Okay. Again, this is uh, linear time by brute force. And what I'm actually doing here is I'm setting up the orientations of the graph that would be traversed by Dane's untangled curve. Right? Doing the reversals whenever I smooth the vertex, um, it reverses all of the edges in some subloop. And if you walk through the, the details carefully, the, um, in, in Naj's coloring, the red edges are rever each reversed an even number of times, and the blue edges are each reversed an odd number of times. So I'm just going to do that up front. Um, and now I have a simple check. If the parity condition holds, then every vertex in this directed graph has in degree 2 and out degree 2. So this first example, ABAB, -B, you can see that the string starting and ending with A has length 3. It doesn't, it doesn't satisfy um, the relationship. And sure enough, if you look at the graph, vertex A has in degree 4 and no out, no out degree 0. Um, whereas these other two codes that do satisfy the parity condition, um, the, the orientations of the graph um, are 2 in and 2 out. Okay. So that one's dead. <laughs> 
So um, I've given this, this graph, but uh, now I've got in degree two and out degree two. So I go to Koenigsberg, I call up Euler, and I say, hey, I need to walk through this graph using every edge exactly once. And Euler says, oh, yeah, sure. Um, in degree is equal to out degree, it's connected. Um, that should work out. Um, and higher halter proved it actually does work out. And good proved it actually does work out in linear time. Um, and so, it, and again, it doesn't matter which Euler tour you take, there are lots of choices, it, it makes no difference at all. So here I've numbered the edges except for the one with the base point, which you should think of being as numbered zero in the order that they would appear in some Euler tour. You can see, I go one, two, three, four, five. There, all, everything's adjacent in the right order. Um, and now, given this Euler tour, I just write down the vertices in the order that they appear. This is Dane's untangled code. And notice, I managed to do this without explicitly untangling each substring. That would have normally taken me, you know, linear time to reverse the string, and I have to do that a linear number of times. I've managed to do this in, uh, in linear time overall just by being a little bit clever with graphs. Okay. The, last, the next step is um, I build the interlacement graph. So the gray is the original Gauss code that I was given. The black is the untangled code. Um, so for example, if you look at A and B in the code over here on the left, they're in interleaved or interlaced because the symbols appear A, B, A, B. Um, and uh, this is just brute force. And unfortunately, uh, because I've got n squared pairs of things that, that could show up, I need to take n squared time. Um, and then I check to see whether this graph is bipartite. Now, the graph on the left isn't bipartite because it's got an odd cycle. So I, there's no way to assign inside or outside labels to those five vertices because I'm going to get a contradiction because of that cycle of length five. Whereas on the left, I have a tree, and every tree has a bipartition. So at this point, I fail Dane's condition on the left, and I continue with the curve on the right. Um, once I have the, 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 the bipartition, I construct the embedded Gauss diagram, which is easy to do by brute force. And then the last step to recover the code is I just contract each of the arcs of the Gauss diagram. Instead of having two copies of every symbol, I just contract having only one copy. Um, and so I replace each of those arcs with an X. Um, and this reconnects the curve in exactly the right way. I mean, this is exactly from, the, the, the figure is exactly from Dane, um, to give you a, the, the curve that's consistent with the original Gauss code. Okay? So at this point, because you're all mathematicians, you are frantically typing up the Python code. You should be done within 20 minutes. Okay. So um, here's the algorithm again. Um, the, the whole thing in the end needs a quadratic time. The, the running time of the algorithm is proportional to the square of the number of symbols in the original input code. Um, but it's proportional to the square only because of the part in the middle in red there where I had to build the interlacement graph. And as long as I have to build the interlacement graph, there's no getting away from n squared because the interlacement graph itself may have a quadratic number of, of, of edges. Um, but this is the, the, the bottleneck in that algorithm. Um, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but there is, in fact, a way of doing those two steps in linear time um, using a beautiful algorithm by Rosenseal and Targen from the 1980s. Um, uh, this is Targen waving his magic wand. Um, it's a relatively simple algorithm to implement. So there's, there's some tricky details, but you've just transcribe it carefully. It's an incredibly difficult algorithm to understand. Um, but just to give you some intuition, the idea is I'm going to walk around the, Gauss, the untangled Gauss diagram starting at the base point and consider each of the arcs. Now, the first arc, I'm just going to declare, ah, I don't know, put it on the inside. And I push it onto a stack that will hold all of the inside arcs. And as long as I push, you know, encounter other arcs and decide that they're on the inside, I push them onto the stack. And when I reach the other endpoints, I'll be able to pop them off in the right order. And when I look at the second arc, 
I see that it's not interlaced with the arc that I've seen before, but this doesn't give me any new information. I don't know whether it should go in the inside or not. And so essentially what I do is I create a whole new layer of stacks and I say, okay, um, in, uh, just tentatively I'm gonna call it on the left, but I reserve the right to, to change my mind later. Um, and then uh, when I see the third arc, it goes, oh, that's interleaved with the first arc. Those two should be on opposite sides. And in fact, it's interleaved with the arc and the other thing. So, oh, yes, in fact, those first, two, those first two arcs are on the same side and the third arc is on the opposite side. And I've discovered a couple of edges in the interlacement graph. Um, and now I can collapse that, that pair of stacks down to only one. Um, so uh, there's a bunch of cases. This is as much as I'm going to go through. But the, the basic intuition is... Um, I keep a stack of the things that I want to be on the outside and a stack of things that I want to be on the inside. And the fact that things don't intersect on those two sides means that when I get, I push things on when I encounter them the first time and they'll be available to pop off when I encounter them the second. And then I need to make tentative decisions. You end up constructing not the whole interlacement graph, but just a spanning tree, which is enough to determine the bipartition. This is, I believe, what's actually um, maybe Ben can correct me, what the, the, the algorithm is actually maybe implemented in the, uh, in the enumeration stuff. The, the routine, it does the quadratic thing. Snappy does, uh, I think it's a fixed quadratic because it builds up cell by cell, so I... Okay. I, yeah, yeah. We're, we're not so clever. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I don't want to give you the impression that these are the only... Um, the only solutions to this problem, um, this, is, this problem has been studied a long time. There are lots of different characterizations. For example, Lovash and Marx have a forbidden substructure, kind of like um, Kuratowski's theorem that a, a graph is planar if and only if it doesn't have a K5 or K33 minor. Um, there's, a, there's a forbidden substructure um, characterization of planar Gauss codes. Um, and, and even, you know, there was a paper just published in 2017 that, that gave an equivalent formulation um, that the, the authors at least found more intuitive. Um, so this is a long-standing thing. Um, uh, lots of characterizations, lots of algorithms, but the one I presented, I think, is the one that's the cleanest. Now, the other thing um, that I am, uh, you know, I, I, I got into computer science and math because I like playing with things and I like, you know, seeing what they do. And so now I have a hammer. I can untangle Gauss codes. I can reconstruct co curves from them. What else can you do with this? Um, and so there are a couple of easy things and a couple of not so easy things. One easy thing to do is to think about collections of curves. Not just a single curve, but, but but lots of curves glommed together. Um, you create, um, in this case, what uh, 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 Scott Carter refers to as a Gauss paragraph, where you choose a base point on each curve, and then you walk around each of them, um, and you write down the sequence of labels that you encounter. Making the algorithm I just talked about work for Gauss paragraphs, it's a little bit more complicated on the uh, there's some more complicated parity conditions, there's some minor changes to the algorithm, but there's no, nothing major. Once you've got one, it just takes a little bit of work to do the next. More interesting, and, um, and hopefully, um, oh, yeah, Ben. Hey, so can I just ask with the Gauss paragraphs? Because, so, so the Gauss code is, if you have something that is, is, is really looks like a constant knot, then you get an ambiguity of a, in the planar graph, and then yes. Um, the ambiguity is the interlacement graph is disconnected, which is actually, it will fall out of the pile of twin stacks algorithm if you just do the bookkeeping carefully. The, the interesting thing is the pile of twin stacks algorithm gives you a representation not only of one embedding, but it gives you an implicit representation of all embeddings where you have all possible choices of how to put, put the code down. So. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. So, so the ambiguity comes about if it's possible to draw a circle that crosses this conglomeration of curves exactly twice. Could, could you repeat the question? So the question is, um, there are there's some ambiguity. 
Not all codes correspond to unique curves or unique families of curves. How does that ambiguity show up geometrically? Geometrically, it shows up, it means that there's a, there are two points which you can cut and disconnect the whole assembly. Okay. In terms of the algorithm, the interlacement graph turns out, this means the interlacement graph is disconnected. Um, in terms of the fast algorithm, that you, it means that you never resolve the ambiguity between different layers of stacks. So these are easy conditions to check. Okay. And somewhat more interesting um, and somewhat related to um, Uli's talk, and so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that he'll, he'll, he'll make it back later in the week, um, is uh, in the, 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 what's now really the, the, the standard algorithm for deciding whether a given abstract graph can be drawn in the plane, now no longer a curve. This is known as the left-right planarity test. Um, it was first sort of spelled out in algebraic terms by um, Wu in the 1950s, but only published by his student Liu in the, in the 70s. And this is really the genesis of the Flores van Kampen embedding obstruction theory that, that, that Uli would have told you about if he were here this afternoon. Um, but in terms of, of algorithms, um, it, it's really fairly similar to the algorithm I've just showed you. So the first thing I need to do is compute a depth first spanning tree, meaning um, explore the graph as if it were a maze, but never revisit any node that you've seen before. Greedily go in as deep as you can um, and only backtrack when you have no alternative. And so I get this directed spanning tree. Now the nice thing about depth first search is if you um, orient all of the edges, it's possible to orient all of the edges that are not in the spanning tree so that they point from a descendant back to an ancestor, which means that if I take any single edge that's not in the tree and I add it to the tree, I get a consistently directed cycle. And if this graph was really drawn in the plane the way it is in this figure, that cycle must be oriented either clockwise or counterclockwise. And by looking at the structure of, of where these non-tree edges intersect the tree, um, it's possible to develop conditions, two edges, because you know, if these were both, both generated clockwise cycles, those two clockwise cycles must intersect. If they're both counterclockwise, they, they must intersect. So these must have opposite orientations. In effect, you can classify the edges as being either on the left side of the tree, creating a clockwise cycle, or on the right side of the tree, creating a counterclockwise cycle. And there's a, there's a relatively simple condition that, this, that determines whether these two arcs are interlaced. So if you want an easy to implement algorithm, um, there's some details I'm not gonna show you, but you just build the interlacement graph and you test it for whether it's bipartite. And once you have this bipartition, the rest of the embedding algorithm is straightforward. And then there's a linear time algorithm um, by De Frechea, Sondra de Mendez, and Rosenstiel, which um, uses the pile, the, the pile of twin stacks magic to actually do this whole thing in linear time. Uh, there are lots of other linear time graph embedding algorithms, but um, this one turns out to be relatively intuitive. Um, it also, in practice, turns out to be much faster than any of the others. People have actually done um, experiments on, on, on actual graphs with actual code. So now um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refer back to, to um, Matthias's open question. Um, suppose I'm not interested in curves on the plane, but you know I'm, I'm a topologist. I want to like add handles to everything whenever I get an opportunity. So, given a code uh, and say some target surface, is this code consistent with a curve on that surface? And of course, we can do this by saying, well, there's the, we can use the Schleimer algorithm. We can assign signs to everything and check. Yes. It's open either way. The only, it, so even if you set G to be one and you want an algorithm to decide, is this, is this code consistent with a curve on the torus? That's an open question. Okay. Um, so there are two variants. You can either say, given the code, and I'll write a specific algorithm for the three-hold torus, or you can say, given the code and the integer G as input. Um, I expect the complexity of these, of these two ver versions to be slightly different. 
Okay? So there's an exponential time algorithm, but that's boring. Um, oh, I'm sorry, yes. No. Or yes. <laughs> I mean, it's two different versions of the question, right? You can ask, is this consistent with a curve that fills the surface, or is this consistent with a curve and I don't care whether it fills the surface? Okay. Yes? Uh, is there anything known about, so in the case where we are picking our gene in advance, mm -hmm. or just determining it from the uh, characteristic, uh, is there some problem, well, if we were to guarantee that this, um, or sorry, no, not the, the unsigned ones, we don't necessarily know. So if we, if we have this unsigned, unsigned code and a space that's guaranteed to lie on, do we know anything about whether or not I mean, not necessarily guaranteed, but if there is one, it's that. Do we know anything about the, what any of the curves that are on that share in common? That, that share that, um, that share that unsigned code? So I think this goes back to um, the, the Ben's question about ambiguity. So it, it, it again, the, I, I, I think the, the short version is I don't think so. But it is, it is still the case that a single code maybe is consistent not with one curve on the torus, but with a family of curves on the torus. And um, at certainly one way to get that ambiguity is to have a contractible cycle on the surface that intersects the curve and only, well, no, have a, a cut, some way of decomposing the curve, so the surface into two pieces where the curve only crosses the boundary of that cut at, at two points, I think might, might do it. No, I should not improvise. Um, I don't know. So um, uh, I, I should say I, I don't actually know, uh, except for Dane, who actually asked this question, I don't know of any results for the first question other than you know, try every signing. But if you impose some condition on the curve, some people have actually done, done studies on um, what are sometimes called lassets. These are, are null homologous curves on surfaces. Um, for purposes of this talk, null homologous means you can color the faces, the regions cut out by the curve, alternately black and white, like a checkerboard. Um, it has, or equivalently, you can, as a well-defined notion of, of Alexander numbering. Um, and there are several papers that, that give algebraic characterizations. Um, there's, you know, for example, uh, the, I believe this is uh, Linz, Oliver, Lima, and Silva. They show that a curve is consistent with a, a, a code is consistent with a curve on a given surface if and only if this equation um, with degree two has a solution over Z mod Z. Unfortunately, deciding whether a system of, equa of equations has a solution over Z mod two Z is NP hard, so that doesn't actually lead to an efficient algorithm. The only, the, the characterizations that we have only lead to algorithms that allow you, that say, oh, well, I still have an exponential number of possibilities to try. They're not just, there's something else other than the signings. So this really doesn't help from the point of view of, of for, as far as I'm concerned, actually understanding um, how these things behave. Um, I th there are many, many variants that you could study. I think the one that, uh, that, that smells the most likely to, to uh, be accessible is deciding, given a code, whether it corresponds to a contractible curve on a surface, meaning one that you can continuously deform to a point. Um, because it's almost like a planar curve, except it just has some extra self-overlap in it. Um, Again, once you have the signing, testing whether the curve is contractible is easy. Come back tomorrow and I'll tell you how. Uh, but it's the, the unsignedness that, that um, makes it this interesting. Um, and there are others, you know, the, the Francis's question about filling, maybe, you know, given a curve, does it have the minimum number of vertices in its homotopy class? Um, is this homotopy to something simple? The Gauss paragraphs, null homo, blah, blah, blah. Lots of, lots of options to think about. But the, the summary is basically, if I'm given the code for a curve or a multi-curve and nothing else, can I deduce something interesting about the curve that it represents or whether it represents a curve at all? Um, and for the planar case, you know, this was solved in the 1930s. 
Um, but for everything else, it's open. And this is somewhat frustrating and embarrassing. Um, my conjecture being somewhat um, simultaneously pessimistic and optimistic, if you allow the genus of the surface to be part of the input, then I predict that every single one of these questions is NP-hard. Any interesting, any reasonable variant of here's a Gauss code, does the curve have property X, um, is, is going to be NP-hard, which means morally um, an, a polynomial time algorithm is impossible. On the other hand, if you allow me to fix the surface in advance, for example, let's just study the torus, then maybe not all, but I think at least some of these problems are going to be amenable to a polynomial time algorithm. This is exactly the situation for drawing graphs. Given an arbitrary graph and an integer g, it's NP-hard to decide whether you can draw this graph on a surface of genus g. But for any fixed genus g, there's a linear time algorithm to draw the graph on that surface. It's just that the dependency on g is horrible and exponential. And so if this, if you want to go off into a corner and think about something, come back with a PhD thesis. Um, there you go. And I'm happy to take more questions, but that's the end of my talk. So given a Gauss paragraph, is it consistent with a multi-curve? Maybe it's simpler to, imagine, to look at only Gauss paragraphs where in each word, each symbol appears only once, which means the constituent curves are simple. That's a good question. I don't know. Um, we need to wrap up. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Repeat the question. Um, the question was, do any of the higher genus problems reduce, say, down to genus one or genus two? Um, uh, I don't know. I suspect not. I mean, the graph embedding question certainly doesn't. It's not enough to, given a, a gra an algorithm to embed surfaces on tori, that's not enough to embed on higher genus surfaces. So probably there's no such reduction, but, but I, I don't know. Yes? So the, thing you just, the, the question you asked for technical curves on the topic of simple curves, so that's from a Gauss diagram. You give me, from, from a Gauss code. From the Gauss code. I see. Do you, yeah. do you tell me the, the assigned Gauss code? Or? Well, if you tell me the signed Gauss code, then I can use Dane's algorithm from the yeah. rotation system. Yes, yes, yes. That's easy. Thank you. Right, so the idea is I want to be able to, to answer, is this homotopic to a simple curve? And the failure modes could be either, yes, it's homotopic to a curve on the surface, but it's not one that you can simplify, or no, it's not homotopic to a curve on the surface at all, and I may not be able to tell which of the failure modes are. Yes? Is the degree graph really uh, mean the even degree vertices can be realized by so the, the question is, can every graph with even degree vertices be realized by Gauss codes? So you can generalize the notation. Uh, it makes the problems much more difficult because, um, say, with a vertex of degree 8, there isn't necessarily a canonical way for the curves to go through. So everything I've done here assumes that you have double intersections, but nothing greater, just so that there's no ambiguity. Um, I don't know if it's known how to reconstruct curves for these generalized Gauss codes when you have more than two occurrences yeah, of a given symbol. The natural thing would they all have to go straight through. They're, right. So there's a but no there's a there's a fork in the road. You could say they all have to go straight, but not all curves that have multiple intersections do that because they might you know might be some tangencies and other there's yeah, I guess if you want them to be generic, they would go straight. But if you want them to be generic, they would only have double points. If you're 
So I think if you insist on them going straight, you can probably reduce to the, to the, the double point only case. Maybe. You, you'd pay some small polynomial cost, right? But it wouldn't be an exponential blow up. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I believe we have a coffee break. I'll see you soon.